Hello and welcome to the West Cork History Festival 2021, which, as you may know by now, is entirely digital. And uh, we are absolutely delighted to have Lara Joy, who has spoken at two of our previous festivals, um, speaking to us today. Um, he is going to talk about um, Irishmen serving in the army and the armed services uh, during the British imperial period. Um, La is the Port Heritage Director at Dublin Port, but previously worked at the National Museum of Ireland, where he curated the Soldiers and Chiefs exhibition, uh, The Irish Soldier at Home and Abroad from 1550, which you can visit, still, it's still on display. So uh, he is going to uh, look at some of the objects from that exhibition and um, share with us some of his thoughts and some of the work that he did in preparation for that exhibition. So I will hand over to you, La, thank you. Thanks very much, Victoria, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, what I want to do is just look at some of the, the storylines that we followed within that exhibition. It was quite a, a challenging exhibition because the exhibiting of, of the Irish uh, soldier in the British Army had never been attempted uh, when we did the exhibition in 2006. So it was one that we, we spent a lot of time thinking about the, the, the very strands of the, the, the story that we were telling in the narrative. That's quite a complicated one, I think, with recent debate about repatriation of, of objects. Uh, but also the role of, of, of the Irish uh, in, in empire has, has become, become a, a popular topic among academics. So um, that's what we'll, we'll cover today. The image in front of us at the moment is, is a map of, of the world in the middle of the 19th century. And it's, uh, as you can see very clearly, it's the British Empire at its uh, uh, furthest expanse uh, and quite a, a very large part of the world that was controlled. The medals that you see there are, are what we call miniature medals. And miniature medals are, uh, worn on, on dress occasions, black tie events. Um, so as well again, receiving a, a service medal, you also get the miniature medal. And what each one of those medals really shows is, is the, the number of battles that were fought by uh, the British Army throughout the 19th century. And medals themselves only start being introduced from the 1830s. And the first one is, is for the Battle of Waterloo, which had been 15 years previously. And after that, you see more and more of these service medals. In many ways, if you look at the map, you can see two key areas uh, of where all the battles are. This is where, if you like, where uh, the, 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 the kind of the, the expanse of empire is happening in South Africa uh, and in particular in India. Uh, and that's where you see a huge uh, number of, of battles uh, taking place uh, and uh, those countries being, being taken over as part of the British Empire. And then as far as ways, you can see that in New Zealand also uh, in the 1860s during the Maori Wars. So it's, it's, it's very widespread of wars and the Irish, of course, are particularly involved in that service uh, and uh, they're heavily involved uh, in, 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 that, uh, in that story. Thank you. That's a, a good um, sort of overview. Um, just to start really at the start of the story of, a, of an Irish soldier who was joining up, can you um, talk to us a bit about why and how Irish men, and they were overwhelmingly men, of course, in this period, um, join up and, and how did that change over time in relation to political and economic events back home in Ireland? Yeah, well, if we actually move on to the, the next image, which is uh, listed for the Conic Rangers by uh, uh, Lady Butler, um, which will kind of give you a, 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 good, a good starting point. Um, so up to the 1790s, of course, Roman Catholics couldn't join the, the British Army. Uh, this is an extension of the penal laws. Um, now there had been within the British Army because of a lack of recruits, recruitment into the British Army uh, in the 1770s with a kind of uh, looking away of Roman Catholics to go and fight in the American War of Revolution. Um, but it's only officially passed in 1796 uh, uh, when the French Wars, the Wars of France start, that you start to see more Roman Catholics coming from Ireland and joining uh, the British Army. Um, and there's an explosion uh, of recruitment from that period right up to uh, the, the, the 1840s and uh, 1850s. Um, and to answer your question, this kind of picture uh, from the 1870s by Lady Butler, who was married to one of the first Roman Catholic generals, uh, General Butler from Tipperary, kind of represents um, an official view of why Irishmen joined uh, the, the British Army. Here you see two recruits coming from uh, a country village, which is in the distance, uh, being attended by the recruiting sergeant. The recruit nearest the recruiting sergeant will one day become uh, the recruiting sergeant. He's very confident. And then his, his friend is looking over his shoulder. He's not fully sure that he's made the right decision to, to join up and take uh, the Queen's shilling in, in this case. Um, so when we look at this, this you know, the reasons why the Irish join are for, for a variety. Some want, as the, the recruit there, uh, marching very positively, uh, want to become soldiers. Others, it's an economic reality. 
And prior to the famine of the 1840s, that's the reality for Irish. Um, if you're a tenant farmer, the son of a tenant farmer, your opportunities are very, very limited. It's quite hard to emigrate unless you have money. Um, so to go to England, to go to America in particular, is quite expensive. Um, so the easy option, if you like, is, is to join up into the British Army. But what's interesting about this picture, this represents a Victorian bias, uh, which is very much that the best recruits are Irish recruits coming from the countryside. And ironically, prior to the famine, Irish recruits in the countryside were, were fitter and they were healthier and they were better fed than uh, recruits from urban areas, so Cork and Dublin, but in particular, the industrial centre of England. Um, and General Butler himself writes for a plea uh, around this time for, you know, to, to not recruit the riffraff. And the riffraff they're talking about are the urban poor, the urban centres in England and Ireland. Um, and they are ideal is strong, healthy, quite tall, uh, and they are taller than their English uh, counterparts, Irish recruit. Um, but this has kind of changed by the 1870s because naturally with the, the famine, um, you don't have healthy Irish recruits. You don't have them being very tall. So you have this kind of, uh, kind of unusual situation prior to the famine, they were very healthy, they were fit. Uh, they're joining up in very, very large numbers into the British Army, um, uh, and we'll talk about later. But after the famine, numbers drop off. Also, emigration opens up, so it becomes easier with the construction of steamships to get off the island of Ireland. Um, between 1870 and 1914, you're looking at about 1.5 million people emigrate, a large proportion going to, to, to North America. And that means that the army is no longer that uh, attractive for, for, for the Irish, and you start to see a, a very a quick climb down of the, of the recruiting numbers. So it's a long-winded kind of answer to your question. So it's, it's you know, there's an official view of why, why they recruit and then there's the, the, the reality on the ground. Again, we don't, you know, literacy rates aren't very, very high in the 19th centuries prior to the famine. But uh, we know about 10 to 15% of Irish recruits would, would be literate. So we don't know why they're joining up, but we presume looking back 200 years later, it, it, it's, 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 it's an economic reality. Uh, prior to the family, you have large families, there's a boom in population, and the opportunities for men in particular are quite limited at home, and the difficulty of getting off the island. That's really interesting. So there's a perception of, that they're kind of healthier and stronger from the countryside and kind of well-fed before the famine. Yeah, which is not what you're thinking about famine Ireland in the 19th century. Um, but they are, and the studies have been done on the recruitment, uh, because you have to do a medical to join an army, and you can see that they're, they're healthier, the doctors are happier. The failure rate for the urban poor is very, very high. I think uh, you're looking at figures of kind of 30, 40 percent of recruits coming from Manchester and Liverpool and cities like that, that they're just not even being accepted by an army, which is desperate for troops. So if you're, if you've been turned down at a medical, uh, then it, it really is that they really want you, but they just, uh, you just not phys physically can't uh, meet the criteria to come in. Just the other point to make about the, you know, all armies, the British army, particularly in the 19th century, is they're deeply unpopular uh, by most sections of society, particularly in England. So to become a soldier, um, even into, you know, as an Englishman, was very much frowned upon by families. And, and there would be a lot of constant complaints in parts of England where, uh, you know, the, the, the merchant class, the, the local middle class would write letters to their politicians, but to, to army headquarters, you know, asking that the regiments be sent away. So get them away from England and from Ireland uh, and uh, get them out into empire because they're, they're seen as trouble. Um, there's a, there's a line that all soldiers kind of say at some stage when you interview them, and 99% of their time is boredom. And then 1% is the kind of panic when you join a war. But that wars don't happen all the time. And when they're bored, they and they're, they're, they're lounging around in their spare time in a small village in England, they can become a huge strain on society. So there's always this uh, kind of push to keep them moving. And they've moved over to Ireland, so the English have moved over to Ireland to, uh, to rotate normally for two years around Ireland. And again, there's a huge fear that they're going to go native, uh, marry a, a local girl and therefore uh, become uh, politicised. So they're continuously moved around. And then Ireland moved down to South Africa, South Africa to India. And that's the important point to make about how empires work. So, you know, the Irish are a very small uh, part of that empire, but they're, they're, they're not... Uh, they're not, uh, they're still looked down upon as being Irish, but they're needed to do a specific role. So they're moved out to India. English regiments and Welsh regiments and Scottish regiments are moved into Ireland to keep a, a, an eye on the Irish, if that makes sense. And then the Irish are moved out. But that's been happening for a few thousand years with empires. I mean, if you go to Scotland 
and to Hadrian's Wall, you don't find many Italians or Romans. Uh, the bodies that you're going to find up there are Romanians. You're probably also going to find one or two Persians. You're going to find people from the greater Roman Empire. But my God, no Italian in his right mind wants to go and live uh, in the north of England or in Scotland where it rains all the time. So this is how empires work. And it even kind of goes back into you know, how the, the empire worked in India. Um, there, there's an Indian army of you know, native troops uh, at the time of the Indian mutiny, about 300,000 native troops. And then a smaller uh, Indian army or in East India Company army and a contingent of the British army. But the majority uh, is, is, the, is the native troops and they're the ones that mutiny. So that's how you run an empire. You, you kind of rely very much on, on the people within your empire to help you to run it. Yeah. Um, and, and the Irish in many ways play, play that role. Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, uh, you had a few more slides here. I don't know if you wanted to if you want to, there's a, just a look at the numbers, there's a slide there looking at those numbers in the 19th century. And then we'll go back to the Canadians. Um, this is what is image here. So you can see from the 1830s, about 40% of the British army is, um, is Irish born. Um, and if you look at the East India Company, again, it, it's, it's quite, quite high. Uh, but that starts to decline once you get into the uh, 1860s after the famine. And so by the time at the end of the century, you're looking at the recruits into the army about comparable to head of population. So at that stage, it's, it's kind of hovering around the, the 10%, 12% mark. But within the, the earlier part of the 19th century, the prior to the famine, it's, it's a very large proportion of the British Empire is, is Irish born. Um, after the famine period, you start to see that fall off, but funnily enough, you start to see more Irish officers. So people uh, kind of um, upper middle class, um, lower gentry, gentry had fallen hard times, their sons, people of Protestant and Roman Catholic are joining up into the British Army. And the figure, you know, for them in India, 30% of, of the officer class in India would have been uh, Irish born uh, after the, the 1860s and 1870s. So quite, it becomes an attractive way of going into the army. It's quite hard to become a member of the British Army uh, prior to 1870. You had to purchase your commission. If you didn't have the cash, the easiest way was to kind of go through the militia or go out to India, join the Indian army, and then hopefully transfer into a regular regiment until your career take off. And right into the World War One, there's a pecking order between the British army officers and the Indian army officers. Uh, and in the seniority, you know, and within the British army, you have a class system. So if you're a member of the guards unit, you're, you're very much uh, one extraction. And then each, you know, each uh, regiment uh, would have had its own pecking order within within that, and that kind of extends into India. So again, it's it's it is very much uh, in the nineteenth century, the first fifty years, a predominantly Irish institution, more Irishmen than Englishmen in it, um, and then out in India within the, the civil service, predominantly Scottish led civil service in India and else, elsewhere in the empire, uh, and then dying are kind of falling off towards the end of uh, the period. Just to go back onto the the, the, the Canadian story, that there is you know. Um, we kind of think of empire, you know, India and South Africa and the various wars there. But here you have uh, the Imperial Irish. So you have Irish who've emigrated throughout the empire. Uh, there's an Irish militia unit still today within the South African army. So within their reserve, there is still uh, a unit that has strong traditions back to an original uh, Irish regiment of the South African army. And they, they celebrate um, St. Patrick's Day each year. Here you have uh, the Irish Regiment of Canada, and you're kind of seeing a mixed uh, tradition here. You're seeing Scots Irish merging with an Irish tradition, and you're kind of getting a, a very uh, different view of what Irishness is. So, an Irish kilt, which is not something that we associate with, with Irish soldiers in Canada. And the same applies then in Australia. You also have Irish units specifically designated as Irish. Probably the most famous uh, Imperial Irish unit is the London Irish, which we associate today is with the London Irish rugby team. And that has a links back to the volunteer force of the 1860s uh, and the establishment of a specific Irish unit in London uh, that you can kind of large numbers of, of Irishmen there. The other two images then relate to you know, the foundation of Canada. Um, you have a, a medal, a service medal. This is what the standard service medal is. It's, it was missing off our bigger map there of uh, the, the wars that the uh, British Army fought. This is a service medal for um, uh, soldiers who fought in the 1867 uh, wars uh, when the Irish in America, it's in, in North America, in the United States, invaded Canada in 1866 and 1870. Um, and you then ironically have English regiments on the Canadian side coming to fight Irishmen. And this is a continuous theme throughout Irish military histories on many occasions, not in large numbers, but you will always find Irishmen fighting Irishmen. 
And, uh, and that's again, the huge explosion of emigration in the 19th century in the Irish story, and it continuously comes up. So this is the, is the medal uh, that uh, was given to those who, who defended Canada. And Canada, modern Canada in many ways is founded, it's given its own parliament in light of those invasions because it's realized that Canada needs to have some form of self-government. That leads, leads to a concept called dominion status and Australia gets in, you know, its own form of independence, if you like, in 1900. And that carries on and it's a big discussion point 100 years ago during our own uh, truce. And then the last image is, is, the, is the Battle of Ridgeway, uh, which is fought in 1866. Regrettably for the for the Canadian militia, but also the British regiments that responded, the Irish in this situation were mainly U.S. Uh, veterans of the Civil War, uh, and held a defeat of the Canadians at uh, at Ridgeway. Um, but at that stage, reinforcements were stopped from coming across at Niagara, and that meant they didn't have the reinforcements to carry on their attack to Toronto, and they fell back. But what's interesting is the first time that we see the use of the term IRA. So uh, on the flag there, you'll see Irish Republican Army. It's a term used in the 1860s, not used again until about 1920. And that's the term that we associate now with the Irish volunteers of the War of Independence. They become the IRA. The uniforms that they wore were designed uh, better quality than the Canadian militia of the British Army. Uh, and each button had on it uh, IRA uh, written, or stamped on it. So again, a term that pops up then and then disappears um, uh, for, for about 60 years and then pops up again. So again, it's just a, one of those curiosities of, of Irish history that we, we led to the foundation of modern Canada by default. Another, another lecture for another year, maybe. <laughs> um, we, want, uh, we discussed medals briefly, but I, I wondered if you wanted to talk a bit about um, the most famous medal of all, um, Irish VC winners. Um, uh, and I'll just open up those images. This is a Victoria Cross. So there's been about 1,300, over 1,300 medals issued since the 1850s when the medals first issued. Um, and about 200 Irish men won the medals. So about 16, 15 to 16% of all medal winners were Irish born. Um, and there's a number of good books on this uh, kind of detailing the, the exploits. Um, uh, and the, the first two medals are actually ironically given to, uh, to Irish men. Um, uh, Midshipman Lucas, who's from, I think, Armagh, he wins the first medal for, uh, which is, goes to the Royal Navy, uh, and he's fighting the Crimean War, um, and it kind of carries on from there right up to 1944, when the last Irish medal was given to a Belfast man who was involved uh, in an attack on Japanese destroyer, destroyers on, on midget uh, submarines. So there's a long and, and a detailed history of, of the Irish uh, obtaining these medals, and it kind of reflects again at that period of the 19th century, but there's a lot of them around. And then as you go into World War One and World War II, less Irishmen are winning, winning this medal. But for 90 years, they, they've dominated. So more Irishmen have won the medal than Canadians or, or Australians, to kind of put it in context. Yeah. Um, and again, the, you know, the story of these medals is, you know, just because you, you, you join, you, you, you get a medal doesn't mean that you're, uh, you are brave, but it doesn't mean that you keep it for life. You find people having to sell them, you find, they also get promoted, but then lose promotion through kind of heavy drinking, uh, don't recover from, from their kind of experiences, wars experiences. So it's not always a kind of a, a, a boy's own story of, of bravery. These are occasions when their bravery is recognized, but it doesn't mean glory for the individual soldiers uh, for the rest of their lives. It's kind of some fairly harrowing stories of, of people losing, having the medals taken off them um, or ending up having to sell them, uh, which happens quite, quite a lot. Because it's awarded equally to officers and soldiers, isn't it? So yes, so that, that would be very important. That was a big change within the eighteen fifties, um, and uh, you know when you get to World War One, you have military crosses for officers, military medals for for men. But Victoria Cross was the, was the pinnacle, and uh, the Congressional Medal of Honor would be the American version. Again, the Irish are overrepresented right up to the nineteen twenties in, in in those, um, and you, you know you can expand it. It's, it's Irish born. So I talk about the the two hundred. That's that's Irish born. Um, Irishmen. If you were to expand it to second, third generation, you'd probably come up with a different, a different figure. And the same applies to how many Irishmen won the Congressional Medal of Honor, which is introduced in, during the American Civil War. Um, so it, it again it reflects that explosion of, of emigration out of the island. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've got uh, another talk actually at the festival about West Cork connections to the Zulu Wars, which features uh, the two famous VCs at the Shandalwana, which were both um, Anglo Irish officers. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then within um, Aurora's Drift, you would have had Reynolds was the surgeon major uh, and he was Irish also. I think there's a good proportion. Again, it was a Welsh regiment of Aurora's Drift, but again, they were coming from Cork at the time. So you would have had some sort of crossover. Yeah. Uh, at it, you know. So, so coming back to India, I mean, th these are yeah. just some images of, of um, in particular, this is the kind of thing that pops up in museums. It's um, uh, a rifle that belonged to a Sergeant Broderick who, who miraculously, uh, the rifle saved him from being shot. It's a, it's embedded with a with a musket ball, uh, and again you can kind of get that nice Victorian plaque at the end. Um, and these are the kind of trophies that people bring back to kind of talk, you know, tell war stories when, when they come back from war. Um, but again, show the large numbers uh, of Irishmen. I think there's an image there. You might just see the, the, the bullet embedded in it. Oh, there we have uh, a close up of it. Um, and at the time, he's a member of the East India Company. Again, with the Indian Mutiny in 1857, which is now more commonly known as the First Indian War of Independence, um, the Indian Company, East India Company, which had run India as a, as a company for 250 years, lost its rights, um, and then uh, it was very formally handed over into the, into the British uh, Empire. And then you see more British Army troops going out to uh, the Empire at, at that stage. So this kind of represents that cut-off period between you know the company running it, um, but a lot of these regiments and, and the regiments that you know he would have been in transfer into uh, Irish regiment. So the, the first Madras regiment becomes the Royal Dublin Fusiliers in, in 1881. So there's that continuous link back to, to India. Um, and then when you look at the helmets, you know, you've got the, you know, the, the classic kind of, uh, you know, when, when you think about British Army soldiers, this is the tropical helmet that would have been worn. It has a, a very long uh, uh, tailored at the back to protect you from the sun in particular on your neck. Um, and then it, it's designed to create a, a kind of an air, air around the head uh, so that you don't sweat too much. Again, this is the Connacht Rangers, uh, how was the Connacht Rangers? And the Connacht Rangers have a long, long history with India uh, and fought uh, in the uh, Indian Mutiny and suppressing it quite violently. So um, had a very long history after 1857, they remained there for 13 years. Um, and you know, from the history, when historians have looked at their own regimental histories and all the rest, they were, they were very, very aggressive against the Indian uh, population, the local population. So you have, you know, Irishmen, uh, you know, being sent to India and then kind of, you know, in many ways, uh, carrying out what's happening back at home uh, in the Indian. And, and the Connex in particular have that tradition. Ironically, by the late 19th century, as a unit, it's not predominantly Connex based. Uh, it recruited, relied heavily on recruiting in urban areas on the East Coast, and particularly in Belfast. So while, you know, we can kind of look at these regiments, the Dublin Fusiliers, the Connacht Rangers, the Leinster Regiment, but in the case of the Connacht, they're actually not a predominantly um, uh, West of Ireland regiment, uh, which is ironic when we think about the, the celebrated uh, painting by Lady Butler listed for the Connacht Rangers, uh, which is very kind of much creating that myth of, of the West of Ireland men being sent out. Please back into what you were saying earlier, presumably about um, emigration opportunities opening up and um, more appealing options than joining the army. Yeah, I mean, today, you know, within all armies uh, around the world, the American army, the British army, um, they're all having problems recruiting into, into those armies uh, at the moment. Um, the life of a, of a soldier, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's not an easy life. Um, and if you're not at war, it can be quite a, a very kind of boring life for, for a young man in their 20s or a young girl in their, in their 20s. Um, and, you know, that's the reality is, is uh, you know, recruitment and armies are fine. They've always found they've had to pay to get people to join up. It's easier for people to become officers. There's a kind of a career path. There's a career path after you leave the army it's, you know, and it's well paid. But for the average soldier and, and all armies, 95% of an army is, is the soldiers and the NCOs and those people who kind of do the heavy fighting. And it can be quite hard and challenging uh, even today to, to get people to join up into an army. So it's not, um, not something that's new today. It's definitely not something that was new in the 19th century. Um, we were going to talk actually about kind of day-to-day -day life in the army. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you talked uh, about, you know, how it's most of us just sitting around trying to keep the troops occupied. Um, but also, maybe you could talk a bit about the kind of conditions. I mean, you showed that helmet. Uh, the yeah. conditions that would have been completely alien to to uh, troops joining from anywhere in Northwest Europe. But that's, I mean, you you can think of, you know, an Irishman joining up into the kind of Rangers and being sent out to India. It's, it's going to take him a couple of months to get there uh, prior to the 1850s. Um, you know, the ships sink. <laughs> So it survived. even just getting there without the ship sinking is, is quite an impressive feat. 
Um, in all the, you know, when you read accounts from people who joined the Indian Civil Service or go out there as soldiers and as officers, getting past the first two months is essential. If, if you can't survive the climate, and this is coming people who've never left the country, never left Ireland, never left uh, England, um, acclimatization, if you can't acclimatize, um, you're going to die. Um, for the for people who kind of uh, are in the civil service, you'll be sent home. But you know, for others, it's it's quite um, it's important that you can actually live in that climate. If you can't, it, it's terrible. Um, and then it's prevalent, and it's you know, disease. Typhoid is a big killer in, in Ireland throughout the nineteenth century for the British Army, but it also is a huge killer in India and other diseases. Uh, cholera outbreaks are, are colossal. And um, so the, the the transition, you know, it's it, it, it depending where you were sent to. You could have a longer career, but if you were sent into India in the middle of the summer, or your ship arrived in the middle of the summer, if you get through that first summer, you were going to you, you could survive. At the same time, there are benefits. Um, soldiers' money, uh, officers' money went further outside um, England and Ireland. So there are accounts. You know, the soldiers suddenly can have three meals a day. They can supplement their food. They can supplement their rations. They can acquire their own servants. So, that, you know, ten soldiers might come together and have two or three servants uh, working for them, cleaning for them, and doing their cooking for them. So, there's a kind of a, a, a you know, a, a lifestyle that you can acquire. Um, but that, can, as you say, can go horribly wrong. It's a cholera outbreak, or you suddenly start to go campaigning and you are taken off to 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 to, to wars, and it can go horribly, horribly wrong. And um, the objects that you see here relate to a uh, Gunnar Larry who was in Jamaica. And the playing cards were captured on a pirate ship in the 1830s, while the boots are, are something that he, he made during his spare time. So something that, as I said earlier on, you associate with soldiers in the 19th century is gambling uh, and drinking uh, and other things. Um, and that's what they were doing. In his case, he has the gambling cards and then he's, he's carved uh, wooden boots uh, in his spare time. And they're you know, something that he keep in his, uh, his, his bag and bring it back. And that's what survived from that time. Um, so, and then the plane cars coming from a pirate ship would be captured by the Royal Navy. They're, they're kind of trophies. Uh, and these are kind of things are, that are brought back. Presumably, the army did its best to keep soldiers busy, you know, drilling and sports. And Yeah, you know. I mean, drilling drilling is very, you know, is an important part of a, of a battle. But, you know, if a soldier's in for five years uh, and is still drilling, it's not, he's not being drilled because he doesn't know what he's doing. It's about keeping him busy. So in particular, you see photographs of some of these larger camps in India uh, in the late 19th century, when they're fairly well, well photographed. You'll see all the stones have been painted white. Um, all the grass is, is neatly cut. And all of that routine um, is, is about keeping soldiers busy. The whole concept of garrison games. Garrison games, again, are introduced to kind of to formalize soldiers fighting in many cases, but it's about keeping the soldiers busy. Um, boxing competitions, you know, cups are introduced, you know, there's you know, prizes, winning the cup, regimental cup, regiments fighting uh, against regiments in boxing tournaments, cricket, soccer, and rugby for the officers. All these things are designed to keep the soldiers busy during the quieter times because a bored soldier is a problem. Um, and uh, the, the biggest threat to, to, to the army is, is a bored 21 year old. And just on that, I mean, in terms of kind of off duty time, is there a, an infrastructure for for going to church? I mean, there, there's padres. Um, is that organised by the army? Yep, from right up to uh, the 1830s, the British Army is very keen that soldiers go to mass. Them um, again, Sunday becomes routine. You've got each religion being being offered mass and soldiers being massed off. Most soldiers have no interest in going. But um, again, it's part of routine. So the Sunday parade, dressing up in your finest, you know, arriving 20, 30 minutes before mass, going to the mass, be it uh, whatever religion, and then coming back is a big occasion. It's all about um, making sure that the soldiers don't go out on Saturday and don't get up the next morning. Um, what's interesting though, when you look at the, the various accounts is that there's a huge concern about Roman Catholic priests. So they don't mind providing the churches and they don't mind providing their own chaplains who've gone through training within the British Army. There's a huge fear that you'd have a new uh, trained uh, priest coming into um, the British Army and going out uh, into empire in the 1840s, 1850s, uh, and, and having an undue effect on the morale of the soldiers and interfering in the command and control. So that's a huge, huge concern for the general staff uh, at that time. And then it kind of disappears after the famine. But uh, at the same time, you know, you, you kind of have units, English units coming to Ireland, uh, and setting up, um, you know, orange clubs, 
So they're becoming politicized. So it's not just um, uh, Irish regiments uh, and Catholicism, there's also uh, the rise of Orangism uh, and then later on Fenians in, in, in the 1860s, which does have a big impact on the British, uh, British Army. Um, I think uh, one of the other subjects that's quite interesting, particularly we've got a, another speaker uh, who's actually a novelist who's written a book about Irish troops in India in the early 20th century. And one of the, the sort of subjects that she covers is families. A lot of um, officers took their families, but for, for ordinary soldiers, I yeah. think um, that was much less, you know, likely. Yeah, no, yeah, up to the British Army, as I say, it's, it's a very heavy disciplinary place up to the 1870s. And then there's reforms, a series of reforms make it a better place. But up to the 1870s, the um, families were left behind. So normally there would be, um, you know, a trove of dice on, on the pier in Dublin. And uh, normally they guaranteed six families per 100 soldiers were allowed to travel. So if you weren't one of the lucky people in the lottery, you were left behind and in many ways became destitute because we don't have wire transfers in, in the middle of the, the 19th century to send money back. So it's really, as your husband leaves on the ship, that's it. You're, 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 you're kind of, you're a goner. After the 1870s, families are taken out. Uh, and that's when you start to see bungalows and um, each camp would have had a, a kind of a strata of buildings, you know, so uh, soldiers' wives don't get with bungalows, but officers' wives do, and, and wives are encouraged to travel. Um, but that's a really very much after the 1870s. The downside is exactly the same as I said about soldiers. Uh, cholera outbreaks, and one account I read of a cholera outbreak of the Royal Dublin Fusiliers, you know, you know, wipes out 50% of families uh, through a cholera outbreak. So, it, it could be a, you know, a nice, pleasant way of life if everything was going your way, but in, you know, just a, in a spare space of a month, it could go horribly wrong. So those families are, you know, are suffering then uh, when they do go out. Coming back to the six families who would have been sent out with the soldiers, um, you know, they're also expected to help. So within the company of 100 soldiers, those families are doing the washing and doing the cooking. So that's the solution in the British Army. We, we're paying the soldiers, their wives uh, and families can help us as we're on campaigning. And what should happen when Wellington um, wins his wars in France in, in 1813, um, at Bordeaux, you know, he has to come back to, to the British Isles. So therefore uh, the, the assessment is made, they're bringing back the soldiers, but not the families. And at this stage, their camp followers had kind of grown into thousands. Um, and uh, you know, I've seen different figures, 20, 30,000 people. Um, they're left behind because they're not the problem of the British Army. The British Army is only looking after the soldiers and they're going back. Um, uh, and uh, later on, of course, they all come back in 1815 and fight the Battle of Waterloo. But the point I'm making is that um, the, the concern is, 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 is for those uh, soldiers and not for the families. So it's quite horrific throughout the 19th century until the full reforms in the 1870s. Um, and then it changed, changes again. So. Just um, going back to India, I suppose, specifically, is there... Is there a marriage between Irish soldiers and um, Indian women? We do, we do. There are accounts. Actually, the, the, the records for this of, of soldiers in India are, uh, have, preser have preserved very, very well. Um, you've got the collections in, um, in the British Library. So you can do that kind of, you can find the attestation forms and the records of the soldiers and find out who they married. And you can kind of make uh, assessments of that. Uh, and uh, you know, the irony, of course, when you want to do that for World War I, a lot of those records, about 70% of them were destroyed uh, during bombing raids in World War II. But you can, for, for the mid 19th century, find a huge amount of detail. So there is, there's definitely uh, uh, marriages. Um, funny enough, the church, both churches take over in the late 19th century, there's more control and that's frowned upon. But in the early days, you know, again, you're not, you're, you're, you're you know, in India, you're thousands of miles away from, from, from England and Ireland. So it's definitely in the earlier period, that's a lot more common uh, and then changes. Uh, uh, as communication improves. Yeah. Just um, turning to uh, the sort of Anglo-Irish officers who mm -hmm. we went to those Victoria Crosses at Ishanhuana, um, you said that towards the end of the 19th century, it was more and more common for the kind of younger sons of middle class, upper middle class, aristocratic families to yeah. join. Um, yeah, no, there is, and that tradition is, is, is there from day one, but it does become more and more common towards the, towards the end of the 19th century. Here you have um, the uniform, which is a loan from the National Army Museum of Lieutenant Pakenham, uh, the famous Pakenham family. Um, and again, you can cut, this is a Hazara's uniform. So this is what an officer would have worn. You can see it's, it's, it's designed to, to be seen. Um, and cavalry officers in particular with their very large helmets, um, they're designed to be seen from a distance. 
um, which is ideal to intimidate. It's it's kind of uh, to be seen uh, and also to kind of to bulk out people. There's a lot of padding in these uniforms. And then, of course, they have their swords and, and their pistols. But the idea behind this is very much to be seen on top of the horse and then, you know, by your, your intimidating, particularly infantry soldiers, but also citizens. Uh, in this case, um, he would have served in, in Ireland in the 1840s. Uh, and he would have been based in Dublin with, uh, I think, the 8th Hazaras Regiment. Um, so again, getting into a regiment for the second and third sons is always very, very important for, for Anglo-Irish families. But also, as I say, as more and more Roman Catholic families uh, kind of go towards the end of the 19th century, you see them joining up. Um, and uh, again, you, within uh, the British Army, there's no representation of, um, of Anglo-Irish families in um, in the generals, in the general staff. So they do very, very well. They kind of succeed quite well. I've mentioned earlier on that General Butler is one of the first Roman Catholic uh, generals. Um, you know, he's in Africa, he's in Canada, he's got all over the world uh, and then dies around, around 1910. Um, Wellington, of course, is, is born in Dublin, family are associated with, um, with County Mead. But again, you know, but in late, you know, by the time he's 18, 19, 20, he's in the British Army, he's bouncing around Ireland, his, his career is going nowhere. And then his, his brother gets appointed to a senior position in India, and they both all go off to India. And that's where they wake. As a family that didn't have a lot of money, they make their fortune. And from his point of view, it becomes recognized as a very skillful general, and then is brought back to fight the Peninsular War. And there I've just summarized about 20 years of complex history. But in <laughs> essence, that's you know, that's what happens. And it's it's by look. Um, and you know, the two of them don't fall ill, uh, they don't uh, and, and they do well. And again, you know, they, they make a fortune uh, in, in, in conquering uh, various states within India and, and retrieving the gold from various uh, various princes that are, are out there. But there are kind of there are others. Um, you know, to just use two quotes. Um, General Wolseley, who's a very famous reforming general, who was born in 1833 and died in 1915. Um, his family seat was, was, was in Carlow, um, uh, but he would have gone to school in Dublin. Again, the family, his father dies when he's quite young. They don't have a lot of money. Um, and he, he, has to, he couldn't go to Eton. He, he couldn't go to Harrow. He had to go to, to school in Dublin. And they eventually had to uh, you know, come save the money to, so he could buy his um, commission. But he describes Irish soldiers, and this is the view of a lot of the Anglo-Irish, and I quote, Irish soldiers should have Irish officers over them who understand their curiously Eastern character and who are consequently better able to deal with them than strangers can. Uh, in quote. So that kind of gives you a, a flavour of the Anglo-Irish kind of view of the Irish soldier. And there is this kind of view of the Irish soldiers that they're, they're up for a fight. Uh, the gregarious, they're very funny to be with, great fun to be with. But when you're in a tight spot, they need to be led uh, properly and they need to be treated harshly to kind of get the best out of them. And that kind of comes out if you can kind of you know sit down and come out with quotes that like all day. Uh, another is Lord Charles uh, Beresford, is a very fa famous admiral, not well known today uh, for the, in the Royal Navy. Uh, for Waterford MP there for, for many years and later on MP in London. But he uh, famously said, and I quote, the Irish race admire resolution and determination and will submit to the sternest discipline if it is enforced upon them by a man who understands them and they respect, end quote. So you kind of get a, a view of uh, this kind of relationship between the Anglo-Irish officers and, and uh, their, their, the Irish soldiers uh, out in these regiments. But um, in both camps, it's say throughout the 19th century, particularly that prior to 1850, they're overrepresented uh, in both both in, in the general staff for the Anglo-Irish officers and among the, the soldiers of the Irish. But it, as I say, it continues on, it goes into other kind of classes towards the end of the 19th century. Thank you. Um, just turning uh, now to kind of practicalities of soldiering when you were either drilling or actually fighting, um, we talk a bit about the weapons uh, that um, Irish soldiers and English and Welsh and Scottish ones would have used in the army. Um, I think there's some images, or do you like to show those films? Yeah, no, they're, they're, I mean, the, we'd have a look at the weapons. The, period. I mean, the reason why the British Army, the British Army does so well around the world, um, and some of the stories are written, is because they have Irish soldiers doing the fighting for them, and they have Scottish uh, generals at the time and uh, Irish generals. Um, not sure what the Welsh did, but the other reason is, you know, in, England is an industrial uh, powerhouse. Uh, it is for most of the 19th century, eventually Germany and the USA take over, but it's also, they, they dominate in technology. So the, the mass production of the Brown Best musket, which is used from the American uh, War of Independence, the 1770s up to the, the 1850s, um, you know, changes warfare. Uh, it's easy to use, 
uh, and uh, it, it can be mass produced very, very quickly. Large numbers are made in Ireland, actually. Um, then you have the Martini Henry rifle, which is associated with the Zulu Wars and the, 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 the Michael Caine film. A uh, single repeating rifle, but still very, very, very effective. And then probably the best rifle of the 19th century is the uh, Lee Enfield rifle, which is used right through World War I and World War II, but starts off life in the 1890s and used in the, in the Boer War. Um, so you have you know, large numbers of soldiers and you have the, the technology. You need both to, to expand an empire. And you also need a very large civil service to, to, to manage it. And that's, you know, that's what, what they, they excelled at throughout the 19th century. So just, um, sorry, going back to your um, images. Um, we uh, have talked quite a lot about India um, and we have another of our speakers looking at the Zulu Wars, but I just wondered if we could um, talk a bit about the Crimean War and Irish involvement in, in that. Yeah, no, the Crimean War is kind of the, the high point of Irish participation, if you like, as I said, it's uh, the 1850s. And um, there's a very, very good boy, uh, a historian called David Murphy Maynooth, who wrote his, his PhD on the Irish in the Crimean War. And, and they're, they're heavily involved. Um, again, it's, it's a terrible campaign. Um, and these are some of the, the, the objects on display uh, in the National Museum. Um, and what you see on the, on the left hand side there is, is kind of a, a Russian helmet and kind of equipment. These are souvenirs brought back from the front, which are kind of, you know, you can imagine why soldiers would bring them back. But, uh, you know, probably the most famous uh, event of the Crimean War is the charge of the Light Brigade, um, which is a, a huge scandal because it shouldn't have happened. Um, and the Irish involved in that, um, Lord Cardigan, uh, who had led it, was, was, had served in Ireland and, and had run up and down Phoenix Park with his cavalry while, while he was here. Um, but uh, the charge of the heavy brigade is, is often overlooked as the charge that kind of successful. And in both brigades, you had, you had large numbers of Irish regiments uh, in the cavalry, but also uh, you had uh, Irish men. Uh, and then most of the Irish infantry regiments are out in, in the Crimea and also fighting. Uh, so it's, it's, a, you know, it's a very, it's remembered really for the fact that so many died from disease rather than the fighting. And uh, it's you know, based around the, the town of Sevastopol in the Crimea, which of course, since 2012 has, has kind of become quite uh, infamous. Um, and uh, it, it's a war very much against uh, the, the, the Russians. But it's, it's for that you know, famous, failed, disastrous charge that it gets remembered, uh, rather than the kind of two years of hard slog uh, that happened. Uh, and it's really, as I say, the high point of, of the Irish soldiers uh, participating. Uh, in, in, the, in the British Army. But ironically, I mean, the Boer War, which happens at the end, uh, the Second Angle Boer War, which happens uh, in 1899, um, you know, again, still that large uh, Irish participation, a uh, large number of Irish regiments. Uh, here you have a, a drum of the, the Wild Monster Fusiliers, which was carried by a drummer boy uh, during the Boer War. Uh, drummer boys were recruited kind of around the age of 12, 13, 14, uh, and, and went out on campaigning uh, there. And there was actually a, a brigade of Irish units, which is quite high. I mean, the, the, a regiment is a, about a, a 800 soldiers, but when you have a brigade of three regiments, so suddenly you're up to about 3,000 soldiers. So Hart's brigade was out there. They, they fight in a series of disaster, disastrous battles. Colenso is probably the most famous one that the Irish fight at. Uh, large numbers of injured and, and, and killed there. Um, but you know, while the Boers are very successful in the initial stages of the war, they're similar to the, the Russians. As more and more troops are sent to South Africa, bit by bit, uh, they, uh, the Boers uh, start to lose. And again, you know, afterwards, it's followed up by uh, a, a war of harrying and, and following the Boers all over uh, South Africa as they're, they're chased and eventually their families are separated and put into concentration camps. So uh, it's one that the, the Irish are, are kind of heavily involved in. Uh, Connacht Rangers, again, were involved uh, down there and involved uh, uh, after the battles, uh, acquire horses and, and, and start to go and take the battle. Uh, to it, to it becomes a real war between the Boers and, and uh, the Irish. Here is a standard campaign medal, but you can see is the bars there of, of the various uh, battles uh, that the, the person who received this medal uh, fought at. Um, Taliga Heights is another very famous battle that the Royal Double Fusiliers were, were based at. And if you do have these medals at home, around the rim of the, 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 the medal on that side, if you turn it over, um, you'll see the, the, the name of the, of the recipient, his uh, regimental number and his rank. And once you have that information, there are various websites, ancestry.co.uk and others, find my past, that you can find out more and more information once you have 
the regimental number, you can kind of go into incredible detail. Um, the relief of Ladysmith, that was the, the big push for us to, to relieve soldiers, British soldiers who were being surrounded by the Boers at Ladysmith, and that took up the, the first part of, of that war. So this soldier has seen a very large amount uh, of fighting, as you can imagine. You do find later on when they come back, uh, soldiers add on bars to say that they were at some of the more famous battles, um, because that's how you get pints. Um, and in studies of our own co the collections in the National Museum, you do find that some of them didn't receive the bar. So for Toluga Heights, which would be one that you could kind of tell war stories about, you might find that this recipient actually didn't serve there, if that makes sense. So um, again, folklore is a, is a big part of the soldier's life. I think it's worth mentioning, isn't it, that medals are something people, things that often survive from a soldier's service and things might yeah. have at home. Um, yeah, I mean, I should make the point at the beginning, service medals are 99% of medals are just service medals. 1% uh, are, are for bravery. So these are just for people turning up, uh, if you like. In a lot of the cases, you know, if you don't have um, some of these medals, you just have three things. You just have South Africa, 1901, and Transvaal, which means you didn't really do too much um, on some medals. So the point to make about service medals is it's, it doesn't mean to see, say that you're necessarily still fighting. While if you're getting an award for bravery, you clearly did, did fight for it. But they are, as I say, about 1% of medals. But there's confusion. I think a lot of people think medals are, are all for bravery and for fighting. Um, most of them are, are just to say that you, you serve there and you have to remember that armies, fighting armies need cooks, they need people to do the transport, they need everyone behind the scenes uh, to do, to support them, to get them to the front. And I suppose if you didn't know anything about um, ancestors, um, even involvement in the army, this is an interesting way in of finding out. Uh, yeah, when, when I was at the National Museum, this would be the most common kind of query, you know, the front desk, I have a medal, can you explain it to me? Um, and it's, you know, it's easy for me to interpret it for people. If, even if you go on websites, it's quite hard to find it. But it's a very easy way into family history. If you have a medal, one medal, part of a medal, you, you can kind of reconstruct, a, reconstruct the, the story. Just very quickly, if you could talk about, we talked about Irish men serving on both sides often in wars. And um, there's the famous, uh, Irish Transvaal Brigade in the Boer War. Um, which that was very marked that yeah this is this was an interesting one in the Boer War that nationalists back at home had been kind of galvanized because in 1898 there had been the hundredth anniversary of the 1798 rebellion and you start to see a lot of nationalists kind of coming together you've seen this the Gaelic revival and, and then the following year there's a Boer War so people like Countess Markovic protests against recruitment campaigns uh, in Ireland and out in South Africa you have a fairly substantial Irish population who support the board. So they sent up, a, 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 again, a much smaller group than, than Hearts, uh, the brigade, about 500 serve um, with the, with the Boers. Um, John McBride, later on executed during the 1916 Rising, is probably the most famous Irishman to serve with the Boers out there. Um, but again, you're starting to see a change, uh, definitely at the 19th century. It's becoming unfashionable to join up into the British Army, maybe for family reasons to do so. But you're starting to see this push to say, you know, don't join up. Uh, and that's really wrapped up, uh, wrapped up in the Boer War. From kind of the British establishment point of view, they, they're really impressed with the Irish regiments. And to acknowledge them, they set up a guards regiment. The Irish guards were established in 1901 by Queen Victoria, just prior to her death. And, and that's a huge accolade. I mean, the two, that acknowledges the, the, the kind of the fight that the Irish soldiers had uh, fought. Uh, but of course, there's the irony that it's kind of, you know, 21 years later, Ireland would, be, uh, would have independence. Um, so, that's, uh, but as a kind of an official way of acknowledging um, the Irish, the Welsh Guards, to give an example, are established during World War I. Um, so this is it's kind of become a part of the Guards regiments, you're very much part of the, the British Army establishment. It's kind of within the pecking order, it puts you quite high. Is that a reaction in a way to falling recruitment? Is an attempt? It could, yeah, it's an encouragement to, 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 to recruitment also. It's a way also to acknowledge that, um, you know, the, that the Irish soldiers are very much part of the British Army bringing them into the fold as recruitment yeah. is, is drying up, yeah. Thank you. Um, just turning, uh, I don't know if we have an image yeah. there. Um, this is really just talking really about the collections in the National Museum in, t in terms of what would have been called trophies mm -hmm. by the people who brought them home, but are often um, sort of ethnographic items or items that were taken from um, dead combatants on the other side. And I just, wanted to talk about this to you in, in terms of how they're being thought about and interpreted within the, in the museum. I know you don't work there anymore, but in the light of discussions about museums and, and colonial histories. Oh, yeah. I know, as I said, this is probably one of the more challenging exhibitions uh, that we did within the, the bigger 
gallery, if you like, the Soldiers and Chiefs uh, contains eight galleries or eight exhibitions. Um, so when we were doing this, we wanted very much to kind of talk about what, um, you know, on the receiving end, and there's an exhibition uh, case at the end on the receiving end, which looks into this because um, there are collections in, in, in the National Museum, uh, the ethnographical collection, um, and not all, all of it uh, was looted, but parts of the collection would have been you know, brought back as souvenirs. But this is the kind of material that is brought back. We think the World Dublin Fusiliers brought back this um, gong in, in, from Burma. Um, and uh, again, Burma was illegally invaded in the 1880s um, from India. So again, this is the kind of material that does, does come back. And we were kind of keen at that time to kind of look at um, you know, this complexity of, of empires that a lot of the participants in it are, are, you know, are part of the empire themselves, uh, and then they're going to other parts of the empire, and, and uh, you know they're looking down on 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 the uh, native people there. Um, so it's an important story that you know we felt when we did the exhibition to talk about, and so more recently it's become again very much uh, in light of uh, events last year, um, looking at that kind of history uh, and examining it uh, and examining the, the role of empires. So it's become very, very uh, relevant again. But it's one that's within museums, repatriation has been kind of there for 30 years at this stage, uh, going back to when I was in college, um, to my master's in Leicester. Uh, again, it was a very, very uh, big thing in the 80s and 90s in, in the UK. But it's one that uh, we need to engage with and talk about. If you're interested, I mean, uh, the academic Rachel Hand has written about the, the museum's own collections, the ethnographical collections, and is, is working on a, a further book on it, which you'll find online. Um, and you know, that again gives you an idea uh, about those collections. Um, when we look at kind of you know collections that are called the Japanese collections, the Chinese collection within museums, these are things that kind of were brought in the 19th century. A lot of them are, are tourist trinkets. Um, a lot of them are being purchased um, as souvenirs or being brought back by collectors as kind of examples of, of good um, decorative arts from Japan in particular and uh, China. Um, not all is looted, so it, it's just uh, you need to kind of to research what is looted and what isn't. Um, what was stolen, uh, what again is something to, to, a, to a, a native population, you know, is still very, very emotionally important to them uh, and what is a souvenir. So, but there is some very, very good research being done at the moment. Uh, and I would recommend Rachel's uh, research, which is fascinating. Just one kind of question. I mean, you talked about literacy rates amongst Irish soldiers. Do we have um, letters, diaries, accounts, which describe not only encounters with in indigenous people, but you know, day-to-day -day life. I mean, do, can you get a soldier's voice? Can you recover that? No, we, we have, there was a huge challenge. And I say literacy rates, I think is, you know, 10, 20% prior to famine kept increasing dramatically after the famine. But um, no, we were, when we did the exhibition, you're, you're looking for that continuously. Um, and you're not coming across them. The officers do write books, uh, but it's always very, very hard to, to find a soldier story. Uh, and you know, in many ways, you're relying on local newspapers. Some letters get published and republished in, in newspapers uh, to kind of find that story. Uh, and that's become easier now. I mean, the more and more the material has been scanned, uh, and it makes that a lot easier. But uh, no, we never kind of came across a huge archive of uh, personal collections uh, from soldiers. Um, though I mean, there are some great archives out there: Imperial War Museum, National Army Museum in the UK, but also in America, elsewhere around the world. They have started collecting that material. But a lot of it, it's, it's, it's the officers or their story um, is, is what gets kept. Plus, plus they're, they're, the kind of, they're, they're trained in a way to kind of you know, keep records, maintain records, and then later on after their careers pass on those records uh, to, to, to archives and libraries. Um, so no, at the moment, you know, and this, the exhibition now I think is 15 years old, it's, it's, um, it wasn't there. And even, even you know, over the 15 years, there's like no huge collection. And that's why important, say, for the, the Irish Defence Forces today are, are doing, they spend a lot of time doing oral history interviews. Um, so that uh, once the paper can tell you so much, but you, you need to record stories very much uh, to kind of to tell the story of, say, the Irish Defence Forces of the 20th century. And the Imperial War Museum, of course, is the leaders of that when they interviewed large numbers of World War I vets um, in the 1960s, which you can find online now. Um, so you need to bring the paper and, and the oral history together to kind of get a fuller story. But quite hard, as you're saying, from the 19th century. Yeah, that's brilliant, La. Thank you so much. It was great to see all those objects. Um, I remember at the first festival, you brought some dueling pistols along, which caused um, huge excitement. So um, thank you for <laughs> Ram Bess and Lee Enfield this time. And um, thank you for your time. No worries. Great to see you. Have a great weekend. Bye.